I think that we're so afraid that we're going to raise, you know, serial killers, or I don't know what way we think we're going to raise, um, that we're constantly controlling our kids and yelling at them. And that's actually what's going to send them torpedoing on the wrong path. So I think the more we relax and let go of our desire to control and micromanage our children's destiny, and the more we just enjoy them, build a connection, express our love, be in the present, and declutter our own life and reorganize our own levels of stress, our children, for the most part, are going to be quite okay. And stop wanting perfect children. Stop wanting extraordinary children. Allow yourself to accept their fallibilities, their flaws, their limitations, and their ordinariness. People worry too much because we are trying to be extraordinary. Because I believe in, before anything else, to have less stress. And high expectations cause high stress, and that is never a good thing. Never, ever, ever is it a good thing. Even with a high-functioning, super-achiever kid, it's not a good thing. So take away the stress, take away the high expectations and the intensity. And a simpler life will lead to a more competent, more empowered, more secure child. That was Dr. Shafali Saberi. Shafali is a clinical psychologist, a public speaker, and a New York Times bestselling author, including her two landmark books, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family, which are some of my favorite parenting books. She's an expert in family dynamics and personal development, teaching courses around the globe, and I can almost guarantee her insights will blow you away, bringing to light thought processes that we often don't consider because of all the layers of experiences we've had growing up in our own life and cultural norms. This conversation was completely enlightening for me, providing reminders that are so easy to forget when the ego gets in the way and life gets busy. I would love to hear your biggest takeaways from this episode, so please respond in the comments or write a review. Now let's get into this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I am so excited for today's guest, Dr. Shafali Saberi. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's an honor. I'm excited. I have read both of your books, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family, and they were truly pivotal pivotal in my parenting journey. And I just feel so thankful that I get to sit face to face with you and ask those burning questions because it's an ever evolving journey, right? Sure. I'm excited. Shoot away. So my first question is something that I think will help lay the groundwork for the entire episode. And I was wondering if you could answer, what is the true role of the parent? The true role of the parent is to um, heal themselves so that they can guide their children's essence, their true selves, into existence, into flight, and into manifestation. So that is the real true role of the parent. Hmm. And how can we as parents become more joyful and less stressful and less burned out in our pursuit to be that way for our kids? Yeah, I mean, it's really a very deep question because that question requires that the parent have awareness, they structure their own life according to principles that are more aligned, that are not chaotic. You know, most of us today are robotically habituated to living these very, you know, obsessively manic lives And we take our children to 10,000 activities a day and we, you know, move them from one thing to the next, not realizing that we are taking them down this labyrinth of complete mania. And then we're stressed out, then no one is happy, then we are in conflict and we're wondering why, why this is so. Well, it is so because we have cluttered our lives with so much excessive madness because of this culture, this pressure that we feel to achieve and to be magnificent, that is all quite unnecessary. Mm. So how do we change that, right? Well, we have to first become aware that this is even happening to us. What if it's something beyond our awareness that we're not even going to get off the conveyor belt? So we have to realize that we are on this roller coaster and then make conscious choices. Like I'm sure you've made a conscious choice living where you are. I'm sure your pace of life is, has got to be slower than here on the mainland. 
And so how did you make that choice, right? You made it because you saw something was dysfunctional and you committed to a different way of existence. Absolutely. That was one of the main reasons that we moved here is because I wanted to slow down. I wanted to raise my kids barefoot in nature and just slow life down, help them to just, you know, provide for them ways to experience childhood at its fullest in a way that's not so stressful. So yeah, when you say it like that, that is really one of the reasons why we moved here. Exactly. So people have to make that, you know, have, have that awareness, realize that it's toxic and then make a new choice, right? So it's a very deep question. It sounds like an easy question, one, two, three, but it's not. It requires a tremendous level of awareness and desire to change and desire to be different. And does that kind of change based on each child's personality as well? Like some kids might thrive more in more activities and maybe others not as much. Is that, do you think that's something to consider? Absolutely. You know, we, we absolutely have to contour our approach and our style to our kids, you know, temperament, and we have to align them together. So it, it changes with every single kid. Hmm. Totally. I think a lot of parents want like quick tips and tricks on how to like get their child to listen. Right. And then we find ourselves in this pattern of like, how do I, how do I just get the, get life to just be calmer and smoother when a lot of times it can be just like a more holistic approach to slowing life down a little bit as, as much as we can while also, also fostering like the activities and types of things that they're really excited about. Yes. Exactly. So, you know, it's hard when you have a lot of kids and that's the balancing act and you have to kind of nurture each one's temperament and match uh, the external with the internal. Right. And I, I know a lot of what you talk about in your books is like bringing it back to the parent and like, what can I change to be my best, most evolved self to help create a peaceful family life? What do you have to say for those who are really feel like they're doing their very best to present their best selves, but like their child still is just constantly has an attitude or won't listen. And they're like, what do I do? How do I naturally decrease conflict and increase cooperation without trying to like control our child? Yeah. And that's why this work is so incredibly, you know, difficult because it is a balancing act. It's a tightrope. You know, you want them to get out of bed and go to school and do some chores and do some activities, but you don't want to control them. But what if they're not listening? And, you know, so you have to work with it, you know, and, and remember some core principles, which are, you don't want to shame them. You don't want to coerce them. You want to be as creative as possible to find their sweet spot and create a life with them, not for them. And you don't project your own fantasies and desires onto your kids you really you know curate a new kind of life that that is consciously attuned to their needs and you let go of the old ways of parenting where you control them where you dominated them where you punish them and you find a new way I mean that's what I teach in conscious parenting is a whole new way of parenting Right. And the creative aspect, I think, is so key. And you really have to get inside yourself and your brain. And before reacting to a situation, like reflect what would be the best response where it's so easy to want to just quickly react because we're all busy and we're like just wanting our children to listen, especially when it's important. And I've found that when I take those creative approaches from reading books like yours, like things that you would never even consider. For an example, I read somewhere, if your child doesn't want to listen to hold your hand across the street, instead of just shaming them and making it this really fearful thing, making it a game, um, like holding hands, um, like, oh, there's alligators in the street, and will you hold my hand so I'm not scared? Let's pretend the cars are alligators, and just creative yeah. ways like that. And I find right. kids instead of coming, that. Right, because we as adults, we've lost our imagination And we just want to do a top-down, hierarchical, you know, command and follow me approach. And that's not the way. Like you said, be playful and kids will love it. Kids love to brush their teeth if you make it playful and make it fun. You know, make them brush your teeth and you'll brush their teeth and brush the doll's teeth and brush the, you know, the, the teddy bear's teeth. And when you do it like that, then they have fun with it. 
But we have lost that imagination and that playful spontaneity and we just do this like, do this and then do that. And we make life so so much of a drudge for our kids and then we wonder why they shut down and why they push back. Well, they do that because we're not meeting them where they are at. We're asking them to come to us where we are at. And that's always going to meet, be met with resistance because children live in the world of fun and spontaneity, not orders and timetables and schedules like we do. Yeah, I, it, I sometimes try to put myself in their shoes and realize like, whoa, if I had these two big adults like speaking into me, speaking to me this way all the time, telling me what to do, that would not feel good. And I would probably have an attitude as well. <laughs> yes, good. So this capacity to put ourselves in their shoes means seeing the world a little bit from their eyes. They are small. We, we overpower them in size and voice and dominance. We are in control of everything. How does it feel to be, you know, powerless? And when you can understand that they, like all of us, want to feel in control, autonomous, powerful, then we will give them that find opportunities where they feel competent, where they feel like they are our leaders. Imagine being pushed around like we want to push our children around. Imagine a world where you make no rules, where you have no voice. Eventually, that child or that being is going to lash out in volcanic anger. So the more you can put yourself in your kid's shoes and, and go, what are some ways I can give my kid power? I can give my, my kid control. They can choose what color plate we're going to eat on. They're going to, they're going to choose whether they sit on this chair or that chair. The more choices we give them, we may feel like we're letting them run the roost. But what we're really doing is building their, their inner sense of empowerment, which is so critical. Mm, that's so true because I've found in my own personal life, the more power that I give to my children, the more confident they become and the more kind they become because they feel respected by us because we're not treating them like these like unimportant, unable to do anything for themselves beings. Absolutely. And let me tell you, when you raise kids like this, it can be a little bit of a pain and a payback because then they'll talk back to you. They'll have an attitude about everything. They have an opinion. But guess what? That's the kind of adult you want to raise. You want to raise a, an adult who has a brain, who can talk back. You know, we, we parents hate the talk back. But when you really step back and think about it, what that means is that we want a puppet. Every human being talks back, right? You and I are talking back. I'm talking back at you. So it, talking back doesn't mean disrespect. It means having an opinion, having something to say, having a vantage, and allowing oneself to express it. And this is what our kids need to do. But we parents don't want them to do it with us. We just want them to do it out in their life. But how are they going to learn it if they don't do it with us? Absolutely. One of my children in particular is very good at discourse. And so if he doesn't like the rules that we've set in place, or he doesn't think it's fair, or he thinks we should do something different, he will respond with his reasons. And part of that, I think, <clears throat> is because we've taught him like, hey, if you don't like what we have to say, tell us why you don't like it. Try to change our mind with your words calmly and respectfully. And I might change my mind because sometimes... Sometimes he makes amazing points and I'm like, oh, I really shouldn't have this rule. That doesn't make sense. And if he's very good at explaining something respectfully to me, then then I do change my mind. And that teaches them to be respectful, to to navigate life that way with other people, I think, to know how to handle that kind of conversation. Yeah. So these are beautiful skills of dialogue, negotiation, achieving compromise, sharing one's thoughts, because this gives them power wow, I can use my intelligence to change the mind of an adult. That's a real power that we can give our kids mm -hmm. so that they know they're not afraid of adults. They can talk with teachers and with bus drivers and with, you know, with adults in the library. We should not create this sort of us versus them approach that often we do with this hierarchical dominating kind of parenting. So for a specific example about when a child who's like a little bit older, maybe seven, ten, seven, eight, nine, ten, and if they're not responding in a way that's calm and collected and respectful, like we're trying to teach them, how do you respond to a situation like that when it when like a creative approach for like a three or four year old wouldn't really work? So 
you know, you, you just, you just try and say, Hey, you know, I, I noticed that you're talking to me with this attitude and I'm just asking you a question. And, you know, as long as you can keep the humor and reflect back and not react, not react in a negative way. Um, I don't, I think that it's a learning curve. Some kids are more defiant and they kind of test you more and some kids are more compliant and they withdraw and they acquiesce more. So again, depending on the kind of kid you have, you take it in your stride and you just be the mirror, you know, and keep reflecting back and you can leave the room, you know, after they're seven or eight, you can say, Hey, I don't appreciate the way you're speaking with me. So why don't you chill? And when you, when you're chill, we'll talk about it versus F you too, you know, or versus, mm -hmm. Uh, leave leave the room and we, we're raising our voice, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's helpful uh, and I remind parents all the time is if you expect um, expect your kid to defy you and you expect them to test you, then when they do, you won't see it as a sign of disrespect. You'll understand that it's part of the developmental curve. Most kids will defy and test and then most kids will comply and withdraw. So you have to know what kind of kid you have. And don't be surprised when it happens. Be ready for it and be prepared for it. Right. And is there any specific tools? It's not, you've already explained really well um, about that. But <clears throat> for children who are especially high-spirited, how can we, you know, navigate and help children to be respectful and listen in the home without, like, breaking their spirit? Well, first stop chasing respect. You know, what is respect? Mm. Each person will say respect is something else. You know, so if the kid curses you once in a while, is that terrible? Like, I mean, I think we become so puritanical and rigid. And if we understand the basic concept of childhood, which is they are learning, they're going to test, they're going to try they're going to experiment, then we won't be so up in arms. And we parents are very righteous sometimes, and we pretty much call everything we don't like disrespect. And we need to just tone it down a bit, you know. It's not personal. Everything is not about us. It's not that the kid is being disrespectful. The kid is just going through their own experience. They're trying to learn and grow and evolve. Um, you know, there was a phase where my daughter was extremely, quote-unquote, disrespectful, and talking to me like I was her friend. And I said to her, you know, I'm not your friend. I'm not your friend, I'm your mother. And she, I mean, just as recently as a few months ago said, but you are my friend, mom. And I was like, I don't appreciate the way you talk to me. And she was like, mom, come on, I talk to you like I talk to my friends. And it was really hard for my ego to accept that. But when I understood where she was coming from, I realized it's not as personal as I'm making it, you know, but, but she was using like the F, like F bombs all over the place. And I was like, can you not talk like this in front of me? And she's like, why? I'm like, because I'm not your friend. And she's like, no, but you are. And, that, and then the dialogue got so silly where I'm insisting that I'm not her friend, which is not what I want to do. So again, it's not so clear cut. And if you understand what's going on inside your kid and where they're coming from, like now when she drops F-bombs around me, she's 19 almost. I don't f take it personally because I know where she's coming from. It's actually a compliment because she thinks I'm so easygoing and I'm just like one of her buddies. She's not seeing me as separate, but I want her to see me on this hierarchical pedestal. So my ego is getting bruised, you see. But if we can just relax, first understand that it may not be what we think. It may have nothing to do with us. It may not have anything to do with respect. And then number four get below the words and understand what is your child trying to communicate. Maybe they're in trouble. Maybe they had a rough day at school. Maybe they were being bullied. Or maybe like my daughter, she thinks there's nothing wrong because she treats me like her friend. So assess each situation. Don't just jump into this cultural roboticism that, oh, that is disrespect because culture says it's disrespect. Yeah, I think that what you said there takes a lot of the pressure off and a lot of the fear away. 
like it, it lets the let's go of the fear because a lot of our like a lot of the things that you say in your talks and your books is about how so much of what how we react to our children is fear based and I think part of it is like fear that our child won't grow up to be a respectful person to other people um, in the real world but when you take that pressure off and realize hey they're just children learning and growing and trying to figure things out it it might help us not to be so reactionary when our children aren't quote unquote being disrespectful, you know? Right. I mean, I think that we're so afraid that we're going to raise, you know, serial killers, or I don't know what way we think we're going to raise, um, that we're constantly controlling our kids and yelling at them. And that's actually what's going to send them torpedoing on the wrong path. So I think the more we relax and let go of our, desire to control and micromanage our children's destiny. And the more we just enjoy them, build a connection, express our love, be in the present and declutter our own life and reorganize our own levels of stress, our children, for the most part, are going to be quite okay. And stop wanting perfect children. Stop wanting extraordinary children. Allow yourself to accept their fallibilities, their flaws, their limitations, and their ordinariness. Mm. That's so beautifully said. Okay, I have another question for you. When it comes to things like natural consequences, because do you feel like there are certain things that have boundaries, right? And how? where's that? It's such a fine line sometimes. And are there any times where something maybe wouldn't have a natural consequence, but kind of needs direction? Like if a child is being like we've talked about earlier about like a high spirit child who does have like a, like maybe an attitude or something. And is there ever a time for consequences or natural consequences in your eyes? Of course. I mean, natural consequences are happening all the time, Mm -hmm. right? So if a kid is hitting their brother, we could tell the brother, well, don't play with him. So then the kid loses the, the play of the companionship of that brother. Or if the kid is being rude to you, You can say, hey, I'm not engaging anymore, and you leave the room. So now the kid has to deal with an empty room. So natural consequences are built into life. And what you're talking about is an enforced boundary. And, of course, there there are sometimes we need to have enforced boundaries. For example, if your kid, you know, wants to buy a $1,600 pair of shoes, you're not going to allow a kid to, I hope, wear a $1,600 pair of shoes ever. And so you're going to say, no, you can have a $60 pair of shoes, maybe, you know. So we, we are always using common sense according to our own values. You know, maybe we don't keep cookies and ice cream and donuts in our house because we know that our kids don't have boundaries. So that's an enforced boundary, right? Mm. So again, if the parent is kind of, you know, relatively intelligent, common sense, and does their own inner healing, the, we're not going to, it's, it's really hard to really, really fuck things up, you know? We're all going to mess it up, but to really mess it up, you need to be like some level of psycho, you know? So don't, people worry too much because we are trying to be extraordinary. And if we let go of that rigid control and just say, hey, we're going to have a kid that's just, you know, a regular kid, good enough, and I'm okay with it, then that takes all the pressure off. And we begin to enjoy our children just in the ordinary moment of it without trying to create this, this idea of perfection. It's this idea of perfection that creates the stress and that, you know, sends us into this chaos when the shoulds are not being met. Right. And when you said about taking the stress off and also organizing your own life, you said that earlier, that will help us to respond better to our children, which is incredible. Exactly. Exactly. So you, instead of looking at them as a reflection of you or looking at, at them as a project to be created or completed or looking at them as somebody to be fixed and solved and managed and, you know, uh, corrected right away, you relax and just go, it's a kid who's learning and it's going to take millions of moments to build their muscles. It's not going to happen today. You know, I still am telling my 19 year old, can you say thank you? Can you please pick up your plate? You know, we, it's just life till they grow up and then when they have to do it for themselves, they will. But you have to have that trust that they will. 
the way you explain it is so beautiful. And it reminds me of my own childhood that when I would go to other people's families' houses and I would see the way that their parents interacted with each other, you really, as a child, feel the stress or lowered of, or lack of stress, depending on which family's house that you're at. And it really does help create a more peaceful dynamic when you explain it that way. When I'm at a friend's house growing up and the parents are super calm, relaxed, loving, you just feel this peace as opposed to being at a house where there's high strung and all these like rules that just seem a little unnecessary. So yeah, that's just a really, really great way to explain that. Yeah. And you asked, you said something about healing our inner selves so that we can take care of our children better. How do people help heal their inner child based on if they had childhood experiences where they felt were damaging from their own parents? Yeah. I mean, they, they take those, wounds really seriously and you know go to a coach go to a therapist take courses I do tons of courses for parents to become better parents because we have to take these wounds seriously we cannot allow our wounds to lay bare and bleeding because they will subsume our children's psyche they will bleed over onto our children's psyche Yeah, I think we have to take the power back and realize that we are in control of our healing and that we don't have to just let it take over us and say that this is just who I am because of my experience and my childhood. We can heal by taking action. And yeah, everyone, I recommend go check out your courses. You have so many beautiful courses on your site. So can we shift the conversation a little bit to like sibling relationships? How can parents best foster sibling relationships? Well, you know, by not, again, interfering too much and micromanaging that relationship and handling their own issues around conflict. The main issue that comes up for parents with siblings is their inability to tolerate conflict. So if you are a parent who wants happy, happy, happy children all the time, then you should not have had more than one child. You should just not have had children (laughs) because it's just not possible. So the minute you have more than one kid, they are going to fight. They are going to annoy each other. They're going to attack each other. And you as a parent need to learn to tolerate that without exaggerating and catastrophizing the problem. Hmm. What about if one of them is consistently picking on the other, whereas the other one isn't really picking on the other one back? Yeah, it's really, really difficult. And you have to empower the picked on child to use their words, to speak up, to leave the room, empower that child not to be bullied versus just focusing on the quote unquote bullying, bully child, the one who's the bully to tone down their bullying, you know, and empathize with the bully. What's going on? You know, if the kid is a bully, you know what I mean, but empathize with them. What's going on with you? spend more time with that kid. It's more likely the older kid who's feeling like this younger one has come and taken his place on the, on the throne. So spend more time with that older kid, empower the older kid that they don't have to hate their younger sibling, that they don't have to attack them, that they have mom's attention and don't play favorites. You know, I mean, those are the standard protocol. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's such good advice. And I think about how, if one of my children is getting picked on by the other and let's say the the one who's picking on the child is calling them a baby you're a baby and i'll tell my younger child like you don't have to let that bother you you know that it, by him calling you that that doesn't mean that you are that and if it doesn't bother you then he'll likely stop calling you that <laughs> right 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 it's hard but um yeah i think the minute you make one of them a bad guy that bad guy will get more angry and Mm -hmm. act out more. So resist the temptation to be referee, Mm -hmm. resist the temptation to fix it too fast and resist the temptation to create a bad guy. Mm, That's such good advice. And I think growing up, that was, that was definitely an experience of mine where I would pick on my younger sister. And every time my sister would scream, my parents would come running and be like, Ellen, what did you do? you know, so then my sister started wanting to scream more and more every time I did something. And it was like this weird thing that just made everything imbalanced. See, so it's, it's not fair to either sibling when one is, is, you know, customarily the bad guy. 
because then the other one becomes a tattletale and the other, like your sister did, and she becomes like, that's not her highest self either. Mm -hmm. So parents need to have this attitude that both will fall into trouble. Both will have to deal with the consequences. Both will face the same music so that they realize that there's no payoff here. Mm. Yes, totally. And not putting so much emphasis on either one as being the issue, but more just like exactly. stepping back. My mom actually used to say when we were fighting to just go work it out in your in our rooms instead of her trying to delegate it. She'd be like, go to your room to work it out together. And that was nice for us to be like, oh, my mom isn't going to just come in and fix it all. <laughs> you see, you see, the best attitude for parents to have is you guys chose to play together and you guys need to fix it and figure it out, especially if they're past five years old, you know? Mm -hmm. And the more you don't give attention and don't stroke it and don't take it as a sensational life event and show complete utter boredom by them, they will not get a hit, you see? And they won't get the attention that they're seeking and they'll eventually move away because it's not exciting. Mom is not getting excited. That's so true. When I find myself getting excited and getting anxious or upset at what they're doing, it does not make it better. It makes them want to do it more. hundred percent because they're getting attention, right? I know. Oh, that's such a good reminder. Thank you. So something I want, to, I want to talk about is how you mentioned a lot, the importance of not putting our projected desires onto our children. And I think that's one of the most incredible information that you've, mm -hmm. that you've helped parents realize. So mm -hmm. can you explain why that's so important and how we as parents can teach ourselves to let go of our ego and our agendas? Right. Well, it's not easy to let it go. But the first step is to become aware that a lot of our shoulds our expectations are not coming from the inherent uh, child and their essence and their desires, but they're coming from our fantasies. And then the second part of this is to really realize when we are pushing an agenda for our ego or when are we pushing for an agenda because it's truly beneficial for the child, right? The difference between telling a child they need to wear a pretty frock with bows and pretty blue shoes versus telling a kid, hey, you haven't had a shower for 24 hours now, let's go wash up. The first one is purely for your ego. The second one is life sustaining and it is truly for their benefit that they have a shower now. So do you see the difference? So there are very few things that are truly for their benefit. And once we realize that most of the things we push for, fight for, argue about, get stressed about are mostly coming from our ego, we will begin to shed that and life will become simpler, better, more enjoyable, more, more empowered. Mm, yeah. And does that go for things as they get older as well? I imagine like what you want for their life and what you think will be best for their life. Yeah, we don't know what we what we want for them. We shouldn't know what we want for them. And we don't know what's best for them. And when I say this to parents, they really revolt. They're like, I know what's best. No, you don't. You don't even know what's best for you. And what's best for you now may not be best for you in two days. So how can you predict what's best for your kid down the line? All you know is the kid right now, you right now, and the present moment. And just keep it here. Now, of course... You know, because we live in this world, they should graduate. Okay. But we take it moment by moment. How they graduate, when they graduate, which school they graduate from is always going to be a moving target. So we can't really focus on too many details. All we can do is focus on the present moment and go step by step and remove the delusion that we know what's best because we don't know what's best about anybody's life, including our own. And can you explain a little bit about projecting our agendas when it comes to things like religion and certain values as well on our children? Yeah, well, parents won't like to hear that. But when we, when we enforce our religious beliefs on our children, we are, you know, projecting. And parents don't want to see that because they don't see their religious beliefs as, as, as <laughs> constructions. They see their religious beliefs as divinely ordained. So when people believe in those things, it's really hard to speak to that. And they are going to feel like they're bad parents if they don't give their children that same belief system. But, you know, it is, they, you know, it takes a highly evolved parent to understand 
that their religious beliefs are constructed by man, something that they have unconsciously, robotically followed, and that they have a choice. Most parents don't see a choice in that. They think that it is divinely ordained, and if they don't do it, they will go to hell. So I understand why parents feel the pressure to project the, their religious beliefs onto their children. Yeah, I kind of feel like even if you really, really believe in what you do, in order to to help raise your children to be well adjusted and not resent you for projecting projecting your own beliefs on them, I I found it helpful to just say like, hey, this is what I believe. But like, as you get older and learn more, you're going to have to come to the conclusions of what you believe. Yeah, but you're you're really open and flexible. Most parents are rigid and dogmatic, and they kind of brainwash their kids at an early age. So the ideal way is to do, you know, if you are going to have religious beliefs, leave it open, allow children to know they have the freedom to choose, and this is not set in stone, nor is it divinely ordained. But if you're going to have, you know, it's hard, it's like being a little pregnant. You can't be a little pregnant, you know. So if you have a religious belief that, you know, there's a heaven and hell and there's a God up in the sky, how do you tell the kid, but you believe what you want, (laughs) you know. I believe that we are, we are, you know, that there's a man up or a God up there who knows everything and sees us doing everything. But you believe what you want. You understand? It's it's hard. It's it seems inconsistent, and it could be very confusing for the kid to go, huh? What? You know, you believe in an all supreme being, but you're telling me who who is in charge of my destiny. But you're like, believe what you want. <laughs> right. You know, it doesn't go together. That's why we have to be aligned. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's helpful too to remind parents like, hey, you could potentially be pushing your child away further by trying to push your perspectives on your child all growing up and saying like things like you can't question anything else or you can question something else, but you have to come back to this answer and not realizing that when as they grow up into an adult, they're more likely or a lot of times might want to push that away further simply because of this dogmatic um, way of thinking that you put onto your child. So. I think that's a worthy discussion for sure. But yeah, it's, def- it's definitely I layered. Agree. It's definitely layered. <laughs> yes. Um, so can do you have any advice for handling ag- anger and to be patient um, in times of high stress with parenting? You know, it's hard to handle anger in the moment of anger. You have to make a decision of how you're living your life. It's a big, big answer. It's not like, oh, how to handle anger one, two, three in the moment. It's why, you know, why are we getting angry in the first place? We, how can we get angry with, with beings who don't know how to be different? They truly don't know how to be different. So anger is a moot point. It's our own resistance to reality that is making us angry. If we flowed with our children, accepted them for who it is they are, and understood that their brain is not even developed. They have huge gaps. And so they're going to forget. They're going to mess up. They're going to be rude. They're going to not use their words. They're going to yell and scream. If we understand that their brains are not developed, then we'll understand that getting angry is completely silly. It's like getting angry with the weather. You know, it says you don't get angry with the weather. You know, and in the same way, our children are like the weather. They're going to change constantly. So getting angry with them is just our own inability to understand reality as it is. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with fear too because we have this idea in our head that maybe everyone else has it figured out and everyone else's family is doing well and they're all respectful because when you see it on the surface, maybe on social media or in real life at the store, it seems like maybe your your kids are the only ones that are acting out and so it creates this anxiety and you're more likely to act out of fear and respond in anger. But the way that you explain it is so relatable and it helps people to realize like, hey, everybody's going through it. This is ch- childhood. This is life. And that's a a really good reminder to just relax because when you take the fear away, it's easier to respond calmly. Yes, exactly, exactly. And how should we help children manage their feelings and their anger? Well, first we, you know, hold space for them, give them, give them the room to explore it without suppressing them or labeling it as bad. And then when they're able and if they're able to talk about it, oh, you were really angry. You were angry because you were really tired or you were angry because somebody got angry with you and now you're dumping it on me, you know. So I began telling my daughter when she was young, oh, you know, Sam got angry with you and now you're angry with me. You know, do you see that? 
and or you're really ups, you know upset about something that happened at school but you're dumping on me and I was like hey don't dump on me I used to make a joke out of it but to kind of show them how it works you know and um, try not to take it personally and validate them like I understand you're angry or I see that you're upset or I'm sorry mommy upset you take accountability for your role in it don't be afraid to you know own it and if they're upset with you it's okay it's good that they're expressing it and you know suppressed anger is the worst it comes out against the self it comes out in self-harming and we don't want that mm, yeah 100%. It reminds me of a time recently when I picked up my child. He's older than an age where like you should be picking them up, but I just picked him up just impulsively because he was in a spot that was like unsafe or going to cause or going to cause like a, a big mess on my counter. So I picked him up impulsively and put him down and he started screaming at me. And I had to own that and be like as much as he didn't have to scream like that and over like just make it this huge deal. I also probably should have just told him with my words like, hey, I need you to get down instead of just picking him up and knowing that about each child, the differences and what upsets them more because we're all individuals that he doesn't like to be moved and picked up and forced into certain places that that's going to cause some resistance. So by me just apologizing and hey, oh, OK, I'm sorry. I understand that that really upset you and putting words to their feelings instead of saying like, you shouldn't, you should scream like that. I can't believe that you're going to overreact right. like that. Right. Right. Because they don't like to be moved around and shoved around like furniture. Yeah. So you could say something like, oh, mommy's so silly, silly mommy. Yeah. Sorry, sweetheart. Right. I mean, why not? I mean, mm -hmm. because we, we forget that they are sovereign beings and we treat them like furniture, really. Mm, yeah, and it helps them to feel so much better when we just put words to their feelings. Because as an adult, it's the same way. If if you're trying to express sadness or upset, being upset about something, and then your partner's like, "Oh, get over it," type of thing, like you, it doesn't help you feel better. What helps me move through it is if my partner's going to say, "Oh, you're really upset by this. I understand why you feel that way." And I think it's easy for us as parents to forget that children need that too. Yes. 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 So a lot of my audience wanted me to ask you what your thoughts are on social media and screen time for kids and TV. Well, we want to limit it to the last possible moment in time. I mean, I know your friends in Maui must be more out in nature and that's what you want your kids to do. I regret the day that I gave my daughter a phone. I didn't know I was giving her a drug. And, you know, my generation of parents can really plead ignorance because we didn't know. We really didn't know. Mm -hmm. We were so excited when the iPhone came out. We had no idea. But younger parents need to know it is crack, cocaine, heroin, all rolled into one. Do not give your kid a portable device until the last possible moment in adolescence when they are literally going to <laughs> leave the house. You can give it to them. Like, try your best to keep them off screens till their teens minimum. Right. And then you want to try a little longer. Uh, no screens in their room. I mean, I, I'm a bit hard about it because I've seen the negative effects. I can't stand it. It hurts my heart. Mm -hmm. And don't use it as a nanny. Don't use it as a candy. You know, TVs are better. You know, I'm like, let's go back to the good old TV. You know, TV was yeah. much better yeah. than these portable devices because this way they carry it on their bodies and it becomes an extension. So if you have young kids, Learn from the ones of us who have messed up our kids by giving, giving them the screens and do not allow the screens next to your kids. They are not equipped to handle it. They're, they don't need it. It's not necessary. Hmm. Yeah. And Let your kids be bored to death rather than get a screen. And do you mean specifically like having their own phone and social media or do you also mean like family movies? No, of course family movies yes. are fine. Yes. Yeah, the, the TV is much better. Because you can take away the remote, they can't carry the TV with them. I'm talking about portable devices, their own yes. phone, screens in their pocket. No, 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 no. Especially if your kids are young, there's, there's no need for them. We didn't grow up like that, so there's no need for them to grow up like that. I am so on the same page. I find it, I find social media addicting as an adult, let alone a young child with a developing brain. And so I'm yeah. trying to get all my friends to be like, can we all just agree that none of our kids get smartphones until they're 18? Like, can we just all be on board with that? So that none yeah. of the kids are like, well, they have it and they have it yeah. because yeah. they don't understand how, yeah. how addicting it is and also damaging yeah. to their psyche with all of the face filters and everything on social media, all the comparison game. I can't even imagine if I went through that in high school. 
Yes, it is, it is toxic, beyond toxic and damaging, yes. And when it comes to screen time, like family movies that we were talking about, what if a child like wants to watch a lot of TV? Do you have, what are your thoughts on just like boundaries for like yeah, family just movies? Like, like, you know, it's okay if they're watching cartoons and, but of course you don't want them sitting there for two or three hours. You know, you want 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there while you're cooking dinner, while you're making something, while you're handling a call, you know, they're not going to be damaged with cartoons once in a while, you know, even tw- Two 30-minute sessions a day is not going to hurt them. Mm. It's the addictive nature of social media that mm. is the new toxin. Yes, I completely agree. We kind of have like a two uh, Tuesdays and Saturdays is when they watch cartoons in the morning. So they have this real structure about it and they know when it's coming and they're not going to beg for it every day because they know they just wait till Tuesdays and Saturdays. Good. So good. they get to do that. And then we do like family movies a couple times a week. And that's good. that feels good for Excellent. us. Excellent. So I just have a few more questions for you. Some of my audience wanted me to ask you, do you feel it's okay in your eyes for two parents to um, have different approaches to parenting and kind of respond to their children differently? Well, ideally we want to be one, but it never really often never happens. So, so you do the best you can, you know, and mishmush it. And, you know, you're very lucky if you both think the same. It's amazing if you both think the same. And that's rare. Most of the times, one is going to be more permissive, one is going to be more conscious, one is going to be less. So you're going to, you know, if it is that way, you just work with what you got and do the what you can do the best you can and minimize the effects of the traditional control, hierarchical, dogmatic, rigid parenting. You want to be more relaxed. You want to be more conscious. You want to be more easygoing. Those kinds of parents raise happier kids. And that totally reminds me of like an impulse that I might have sometimes to want to say no to something. But if I stop for a moment before replying, it'll help me think, wait, do I need to say no to this? Something like my little three-year-old girl wanting to play with this lip gloss she found in my in my bag. And I know it's going to cause a mess. And I know she's going to get it all over her arms and her face, but she wants to use the lip gloss. And so instead of saying no, just saying yes, like go ahead and use it. And in my head, I'm like, we'll clean her up in like 15 minutes. <laughs> Right, right. I always tell parents to try and find the no before you uh, try and find the yes inside the no. Try and find the yes before you say no. Try and find the, a way to change the no to a yes. So even if you're saying no, you're actually saying yes. Something like, what a great idea to watch that movie. But oh no, we can't watch it today. But can we watch it tomorrow? Mm-hmm. You see? Yes. Like you're honoring the desire, but and you're not just shooting them down. Yes. You're finding a way to affirm their their life desire and understanding that they have desires just like you, but you're not capitulating to it and indulging it, but you're also not just shooting it down because it's such a dumb idea, mm-hmm. you know? Totally. That's such a good reminder. Um, I have two more questions. What is the most common mistakes parents make in parenting? The most common mistake, I think, is that they take it personally. They think it's against them, for them, to them. Everything is about them, 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 them. And as long as they come like that, they're going to mess it up and they're going to lose connection. And I think another common mistake is that they believe that correction is as important as connection. And it isn't. Connection comes before correction. I always tell parents that. Mm, That's so important because when we connect with our child, we're more likely to have an easier relationship where we won't need to correct as much. Yes. It's so true because you could have days where you're like, why is everything off? Why is there so much attitude? Why is nothing vibing? And then when you just bring that connection together, the next day is like the most peaceful day ever. And it really shows how important connection is. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I really, I wanted to ask you this that I've never heard you speak on. Maybe, maybe you've said it before, but I just have missed it. But what was your childhood like and how has that influenced who you've become today and what you're passionate about? Yeah, so, I mean, that's also a very complex question, but just simply put, I was raised with uh, almost very low expectations. And what that means is I was raised uh, with no stress, you know, very, very relatively little stress. So I laugh with my parents. I go, you guys didn't expect much of me, but thank goodness, because I was allowed to find my own inner expectation and I didn't feel stressed. I didn't feel pushed. I felt like I had to push. Like, can I please take that class? Can I please do more? Can I please study more? 
they I don't know what they they thought I would turn out to be but and part of it I think was because they just saw that I was naturally hard working I don't know but I just have raised my daughter in the same way because I believe in before anything else to have less stress and high expectations cause high stress and that is never a good thing never ever ever is it a good thing even with a high functioning super achiever kid it's not a good thing so take away the stress take away the high expectations and the intensity and a simpler life will lead to a more competent more empowered more secure child mm. Yeah, that reminds me a little bit of my own childhood, how my parents were never suspicious of me. They were never thinking I was breaking rules or going behind their back. And as a result, like they just trusted me a lot. And I and so because I felt trusted, I didn't I didn't feel a need to lash out or to hide things because I knew that if I did mess up, like they were always there with a calm demeanor. And I don't have a single memory of my parents yelling at me. So, yeah, I think that you're onto something there completely. I love it. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for all of your insight. I really appreciate everything that you have to share and put out into the world. And I definitely recommend everyone listening or watching to, watching this to read both of her books, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family. They're really, really inspiring and pivotal. And I found them very influential in my own parenting journey. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Continue the great work. Bye. Bye. Bye.